Good evening. We welcome you to this very special evening. We want to thank the donors that have helped provide for the funding for this program. I'm speaking specifically about HTC. I want to ask for a show of hands of those of you who are customers of HTC. Mike, I just want to get a sample size. <laughs> but uh, we do have a fire stick at home, so uh, we're grateful for uh, the fact that HTC, which was founded in 1952, our university was founded in 1954. Uh, we've grown up together here in Morgan County. And we're grateful for the support for Mike and his successor, Carlton. Thank you all for being here tonight. I had a chance to visit with our speaker tonight and uh, his wife at the game, uh, the football game the, the other day, and I called them the best dressed faculty on campus. <laughs> Uh, the teal colored Timberlands that he had on were only outdone by his outfit scene. <laughs> but in talking to uh, Professor Clary that, uh, that afternoon, I was so excited about being here because I know this topic, this presentation means so much to him personally. And uh, we're delighted that he is our distinguished uh, teacher scholar and is presenting the HDC Distinguished Teacher Scholar Lecture for 2022. So with uh, no more words for me, uh, I do want to turn it over to our provost, who, as you know, is the former dean of the Edwards College, and my friend, Dr. Dan Hennis. Thank you. Good evening. It's nice to be back in the Edwards College. Uh, before I go to my main remarks, I want to say thank you to everyone who made this evening possible, particularly the staff in my office, the staff in the Dean's office here at the Edwards College, uh, Aramark, and the staff at Special Events who brought all this together for the great food. Uh, also, thank you to Jim Arn and the gallery staff for putting together uh, a great show that complements what I'm sure is going to be uh, an interesting discussion. So, one of the time-honored descriptors of the university is a community of scholars. In this place, faculty acting as scholars and artists create knowledge. But as educators, faculty are also charged with being transmitters of such knowledge. In the ideal, the teacher-scholar faculty is composed of individuals who, as teachers, communicate what they, as scholars, are still learning. To recognize the special role of communication in the teacher-scholar process, the university, with the support of the Ori Telephone Cooperative established the Distinguished Teacher Scholar Lecturer Award. The intent of this award is to recognize annually a Coastal Carolina University faculty member who has distinguished him or herself as a teacher and a scholar and a communicator. The awardee is an individual who embodies the university teacher scholar ideal of searching for knowledge through critical inquiry and through creativity and transmitting that knowledge through teaching and communication with the community. To underscore the communication aspect of the teacher-scholar process, the awardee presents an original lecture or presentation to the university community and community guests on a topic that illustrates the depth and breadth of the awardee's teacher-scholar abilities. In this event, then, you will see the three roles that our best faculty at Coastal can inhabit. The teacher who enriches the students, the scholar who enriches the discipline, and the lecturer who enriches the audience. On October 17, 1996, the first of these lectures was presented by Professor Edgar Dyer, who discussed the process of drafting the U.S. Constitution. Since then, since that first lecture in this series in 1996, we've been honored with presentations on linguistics, history, ecology, education, national security, nutrition, economics, literature, physics, biology, and archaeology, to name only some of the disciplines upon which the honorees have spoken over more than two decades in the history of this award. I've had the honor to attend many of the lectures in this series. I'm always impressed with the ability of the speaker, and tonight will be no different when we hear from Professor Clary. What makes this award distinctive is that it is not given to the scholar who publishes the most. 
or to the researcher who secures the most grant funds, or the instructor who is most popular with the students. Instead, this honor places a premium on the transmission of knowledge, on the individual who can take a complicated subject and share it with an interested, intelligent, but varied audience. As such, the best of these lectures showcases gifted communicators, public academics who can share their discipline with the wider community. The more we at Coastal Carolina do these things, the lower the barriers are between town and gown, the lower the barriers there will be between the academy and the citizenry. So I find it fitting that this award exists thanks to the generosity of an organization that is dedicated to communication, HTC and that this organization was founded by and for the citizens of Horry County, the same citizens who helped found this university. With that, I invite President Michael T. Benson to return to the stage with HTC representatives. We are honored to have Mike Hagg, the Chief Executive Officer, and Carlton Lewis, the Chief Operating Officer, and I invite Professor Clary up for the presentation of the award.
commissioned two of his, who had did two commissions for the headquarters, um, Amazon. The president and founder of Savannah College of Art and Design is one of his collectors. The Music City Center in Nashville, Tennessee, the Paper Factory Hotel and Cosmopolitan Hotel, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, going on a cruise, make sure you check. <laughs> First Bank, Taufa Museum of Art, Asheville Art Museum, and, which explains his amazing sense of fashion, Pierre Cardon. Purchased Professor Clare's first large scale paper installation for his personal collection and to then also um, posted a solo exhibition at Pierre Cardin's gallery in Paris. His work also hangs in my office, in this building, <laughs> and in my house. <laughs> so, Professor Clare is not only a superstar, however, in his creativity, skill, and his productivity, he's also a superstar in the classroom. The majority of the courses he teaches at Coastal Carolina University are foundational courses for majors and minors in the Department of Visual Arts. He also teaches non-majors and upper level courses as well as the senior capstone for visual arts majors. Professor Clary's students deeply appreciate his passion for the arts, his calm and endearing sense of humor, and his never ceasing encouragement and support. The students have recognized his teaching excellence by awarding him Professor of the Year in Visual Arts. Professor Clary's personal hardships in life have shaped him into becoming an instructor who deeply cares about each and every one of our students. He models to his students how perseverance, hard and dedicated work, and trust in their own abilities will enrich their lives and make them better artists and more successful and prepare them for post-graduation life. Professor Clary models what we mean when we speak of the teacher scholar model. In the classroom and every time he addresses his audience as an artist and as a professor. We are so lucky to have Professor Clary on our faculty here at Coastal Carolina University and as our distinguished speaker tonight. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Charles Clary. Some of my students here from this semester is just beyond my gratitude. Uh, so it's, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, I am going to be reading my presentation tonight because if I don't, then I'll ramble and I'll keep you here for an hour and a half. <laughs> you'll cry, you'll laugh, you'll do other things. It'll be <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, so thank you so very much, Dean Bornholt, for that introduction and your continued support. It is humbling to receive this prestigious award. First of all, I would like to thank HTC for the distinguished honor. Thank you to President Michael T. Benson and Provost Dan Ennis for hosting this event. I'd also like to thank my chair and dear friend, Dr. Stephanie Miller for the nomination, as well as Assistant Dean Easton Selby for always believing in my work. To my colleagues in the visual art department, thank you so very much for having me. And most importantly, to my wife, Dr. Katie Clary, whose unwavering support and love has seen me through some of my darkest days. As she nods her head, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so many artists have explored death in their work. Often works of art about death and dying depict the personification of death, making the intangible tangible. While the Black Death ravaged Europe in the 16th century, Peter Bruegel explored death through the depiction of the horrors of the human condition and the struggle just to survive by painting the triumph of death. His epic depictions confront mortality and the tenuous thread between this life and the next. The painting confronts the inevitability of our own mortality, no matter what place we hold in society, whether it is younger or old, rich or poor, strong, weak, nobility or peasant, Keith Haring was a prominent graffiti artist that created a playful yet graphic imagery that addressed the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, otherwise known as AIDS, pandemic of the 1980s. His work confronted this pandemic in a symbolic way, depicting the figure as an icon similar to that of a bathroom signage, having no gender, race, or persona. This neutralized the argument that this was only a disease of gay men 
and it helped to humanize those who were ill. His art brought much needed awareness to a disease that many did not understand. During his own fight with HIV AIDS, he became an outspoken advocate for ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power and many other organizations. Nan Golden explored the slippage of one's life through intimate photography. One of her most emotional works was a series of photographs documenting one couple's excruciating experience with HIV AIDS and the transformation that occurred from the subject's diagnosis to death. In the poignant image titled Gaucho Kissing Giles, we are witnessing or witnesses to the passing of Giles as his partner tenderly kisses him lightly on the forehead for one last goodbye. Golden's photographs are like frozen moments in time capturing the essence of what it is to love and all that is lost in an instant. Teresa Margulies explores the notion of what it means to be immersed in death through interactive spaces. One of her most powerful works is her installation, Vaporized. In this installation, Margulies created a fog-like mist that the viewer becomes enveloped in as they traverse the space. The viewer becomes a ghostly apparition meandering the void as they navigate themselves through the exhibition. This is no ordinary mist, however. It is the water that was used to wash corpses from the morgue in Mexico City. In this piece, both the living and the dead confront one another in the depths of the unknown. And the installation forces the viewer to confront their own mortality. Felix Gonzalez Torres recalls the loss of his beloved through interactive installations, inviting the viewer to participate in the experience. In Gonzalo Torres' installation piece titled, Untitled, Portrait of Ross in LA, a mound of candy weighing roughly 175 pounds sits in the corner of the gallery. Viewers of the work are encouraged to take a piece of candy, eventually leaving a void within the gallery space. This transition represents his partner, Ross Laycock, as well as his experience in inevitable death from HIV AIDS and the wasting away of oneself as the body slowly succumbs to the disease. At his death, Laycock weighed 175 pounds. Some, like Matoi Yamamoto, explores large-scale Lamparithian installations using salt to act as a kind of purification process associated with the Japanese culture. His work reflects on the passing of his sister in 1994 to brain cancer and his spouse, who also passed away due to cancer some years later. The meditative and at times painful process of his work acts as a form of therapeutic catharsis. At the end of each exhibition, the salt is swept up and returned to the sea. Candy Chang is a socially engaged artist that creates large-scale, interactive works that force the viewer to contemplate their existence and then what they would like to achieve before they die. Her series, Before I Die, I Want To, has been installed all over the world and is a poignant metaphor to not take any moment for granted and live life to the fullest. Jody Carey is an artist that deals with the ephemerality of life and how fragile it can be. Her works are monumental in scale, created from thousands of hand-cast plaster bones, often weighing several thousand pounds. She addresses mortality and the corporal and how fleeting life can be. These artists have an immense influence on the way I explore my own work, and they have transformed the way I think about grief and trauma. Their work assisted me through my own traumas and gave voice to my personal struggles. While mourning art has been around for centuries, it has evolved and continues to be a way to remember and carry with us the memory of those who we have lost. These tokens of mourning, whatever form they may take, be it a ring, necklace, brooch, or piece of cherished art, lightens the load of losing someone dear to us. My work seeks to explore this connection between memory, art, death, and grief, and how it involves the notion of memento mori. I use cartoon imagery to kind of blunt the force of a lot of what I'm talking about. Um, so there we go. <laughs> my work deals with the passing of my mother and father in 2013 due to smoking-related cancers and the trauma of my childhood that resurfaced after those events. 
I grew up in a single parent broken home after my mother and father divorced when I was quite young. They each suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. My father's stemmed from his deployment to Vietnam and my mother's manifested from unimaginable childhood trauma. To deal with their mutual pain, they turned to alcohol. Both became alcoholics and chain smokers and eventually the stress between them became too much for either of them to bear. Sorry, again, dramatic reenactment. <laughs> As a child, this situation terrified me in ways I can't begin to describe. My father left when I entered fifth grade and my mother was left to care for myself, my two other siblings, a twin brother, and an older sister. Normalcy in our household became a living nightmare, not knowing what to expect from one day to the other. My mother did the best she could, but suffered from depression herself and turned to drinking and animal hoarding to cope with her situation. This led to horrible living conditions, along with agonizing bullying in school for my clothes and my odor. We were very poor, living on an elementary school teacher salary to support three kids. My mother often had a second job just to help put food on the table. I still suffer from nightmares, anxiety attacks, and depression from these traumatic experiences and have found it exceedingly difficult to cope with the everyday. However, during these times, I often turned to art as a place of escape and became an obsessive maker of things. Little did I know that this would influence the trajectory of my artistic endeavors. In the summer of 2012, both my parents were diagnosed with various stage four cancers caused by excessive chain smoking. For my mother, it was stage four small cell carcinoma of the lungs that had already metastasized and spread to her bones and bone marrow. While my father had been diagnosed with mouth and esophageal cancers, both were terminal in diagnosis and I was rocked to my core. How does one be even begin to process the inevitability of losing one, let alone two parents? My mother, albeit flawed, was one of my best friends. We had our moments just like any son and mother relationship, exacerbated by her failings as a caregiver. But I loved her more than words could describe. She was an anchor in the cataclysmic storm of my youth. She had been a champion of my work and who I'd become as a young adult. My father, on the other hand, had been absent most of my life. I knew him in name only and struggled to find any connections worth the effort. He just became a person I knew rather than a real father figure, something he never really owned up to. Watching someone slip away to this horrible disease is like watching the tide slowly wash out to sea. It happens incrementally and painfully slow. The chemotherapy takes an unimaginable toll on the body and psyche as the body begins to wither away and become so delicately frail. Grief is a fickle beast. It comes in waves and ebbs and flows over time. It affects us all in the most complicated of ways and is not a one-size-fit-all emotion. For me, grief took its time and came in spurts. The day I was informed of my mother's lung cancer diagnosis was a blur. I remember being at my university taking care of last minute ordinary duties when the phone rang and the call for me to come home right away was a palpable one. It was as if I was being called up for an epic showdown between my mother and an insurmountable enemy. The next seven months came and went like any other. I would travel every weekend to be with her as she fought this unforeseen, unforeseen source, trying to remain as calm and hopeful as I could for her even though I knew the outcome before we had even started the journey. My mother did her best to keep her spirits up, but inevitably sank into depression and struggled to come to terms with the eventuality of her fight and the looming mystery of death. Many of our conversations avoided the topic of death altogether, as if the mere mention of this certainty would summon death's presence and sweep her away to the great beyond. Once the cancer had migrated to the lining of her brain and then the brain itself, we knew that her time was running short and that chemotherapy and radiation should be stopped so that her quality of life could be maintained for the little time she had left. The day she passed, I remember being awoken at 4 a.m. to the news from my brother, breaking down, then rushing the three and a half hours home to be with her one last time before her cremation. I remember sobbing uncontrollably at her deathbed, holding her hand, stroking her hair, 
reiterating all the while that I would do everything in my power to make her proud. On that day, February 15th, 2013, at 4 a.m., my mother took her last breath and lost her battle with cancer. That was the day my world changed forever. Two weeks later, my father succumbed to his battle with cancer as well, and in a moment I was adrift in the world without an anchor. At my mother's funeral, emotions came and went as I navigated the complicated relationship between my brother and sister, all the while trying to maintain composure as a stream of attendees kept coming. Oh, how wonderful it was to see how many lives she had touched. I forgot to mention, she was a third grade teacher for 29 years. Um, I thought my grief would subside after a year, but it lingered for seven a constant reminder of all that I had lost with inundations of memories that inevitably resurfaced that I had buried deep within my psyche for much of my life. At first, I stopped making art completely. I was so lost in my despair, grief, and personal mourning process, I couldn't summon the courage or energy to do much of anything, nor did I really want to. It all seemed so meaningless without her presence. I struggled with the absence of my mother's complicated comfort, yet carried a heavy guilt for feeling nothing or not allowing myself to feel anything for my father. After a few months, however, the overwhelming urge to make became too strong, and I was compelled to re-engage with my studio practice. Little did I know how intrinsically linked my grief and art practice would become. I knew the first piece I was going to make would be a difficult and needed to be a tribute to my mother's life and all that she went through and how much she meant to me. I also knew that it needed to correlate to my experience of watching her slip away day by agonizing day. As a paper artist, I began to draw a connection to the materiality of my medium and the fragility and rigidity of human life. The abstracted forms that I began to use in my work resembled that of cancer cells under electron microscope magnification And without the contextual aspect of the disease, the imagery became quite beautiful and mesmerizing. This was going to be a monumental undertaking, as I decided I would create a paper construct for every day for my mother's diagnosis till her death. Hopefully the video plays. This is just a a process of how I actually work, and then I'll go into the work itself.
have to credit my students. They're some of the best. They use this for a stop motion project that they did in a, another class while I was teaching at that university. Um, do you know how I advance? Ah, there we go. Okay, cool. Um, I knew the sizes would mimic each day, however traumatic or mundane, and be a lasting documentation of her courage and fear. I ended up making 272 pieces, seven 17 inch by 17 inch large scale towers that represented her final months, 26 12 by 12 medium sized towers that represented her final weeks, and 139 smaller towers that represented the days that were left. Making the work was a cathartic and memorable experience as I was able to reclaim each day that was lost through the act of creation. I recalled our long talks late at night as I watched over her. I remember her smile and her laugh, and I experienced her tears and fearfulness. No matter what her mood, I cherished those days more than any I'd had in some time. To give you a scale, this is eight feet by 145 feet, or no, eight feet by 45 feet by about 10 inches off the wall. The work became an embodiment of her spirit that lived through me. The entirety of the process became my personal remission. Oh, hold on. Ah, sorry, I missed one, sorry. <laughs> the installation of the piece in the gallery, however, was heartbreaking. I really have relived each day as each tower was hung in the space. Also, also, almost as if I was in a secondary countdown of losing her all over again. How does one lose someone twice in one year, I thought. The work became an embodiment of her spirit that lived through me. The entirety of the process became my own personal remission, something my mother was not afforded. When the project reached its completion, a way in which I could limp forward with my life and try to regain some semblance of happiness. Poignantly, it took seven months from start to completion for this insulation, almost the exact same time frame of my mother's illness. My parents' passing continued to leave a deep void in my life, and I knew that I would, it would affect every aspect of future bodies of work. How could it not? This realization led to my interest in memento mori, remembering that one day you will die, and a reinvestigation of my own childhood trauma, abuse, and mortality. Memento mori is a phrase associated with Julius Caesar of Rome, who is said to have had a person with him on his triumphal marches, whose whole job was to whisper the phrase meaning, remember, you will die, to keep him humble and grounded. However, in modern times, this has become a standard trope. In fact, no other ancient authors confirmed this actually happened, and it may have been Christian moralizing rather than an accurate historical report. During the Renaissance and after and through the horrors of the Black Death, dance macabre and memento mori became associated with Christians seeking to remember that their journey would end in death, but life everlasting through their religion. This was a concept my mother struggled with in the end, the helpless notion of not knowing what or if anything was to come next. Skeletons, skulls, and death motifs remained popular through the ages and were again repopularized by the British Queen Victoria. This storied past of memento mori and morbid iconography influences the way I think about mortality death, and living. Through these investigations, I came to terms with the trauma of my childhood and the lack of memories I actually have. Although the entire breadth of Memento Mori is fascinating, I'm particularly drawn to the Victorian area. Queen Victoria helped popularize the tradition after her husband, Prince Albert, passed away. She followed traditional mourning customs, but was so taken with the loss of her beloved that she stayed in mourning wear for the rest of her life. She also had several mementos and monuments made to commemorate his passing. The trend took off and many began to take part in the practice, especially that of mourning jewelry. These items could take many forms and often contain the hair of the lost loved one. These items became a symbol of their being and a way to keep them close even after death. In recent, more recent explorations of mourning jewelry, you can now have your loved one's ashes compressed through pressure-controlled environments, creating a diamond to re remember them by, or encasing them in resin molds, creating more contemporary forms of jewelry. My work focuses on Memento Mori, remember that you have to die, and Memento Vivere, remember to live. 
Pulling from the Victorian fascination and celebration of death and life, I explore these traditions through a contemporary lens. Instead of hair from the deceased, I use paper, which holds the same quality of fragility, rigidity, and delicacy. It also acts as a catalyst for the memory of my mother, as this was the one thing we never argued over and could celebrate together. As I slice through each layer of paper, I begin to think about my own mortality, each subtraction becoming, in essence, a loss of oneself to time. I began using paper in 2007, while I was studying for my Master of Fine Arts in painting at the Savannah College of Art and Design. I had a residency in New York, and I did not have access to materials as usual or a functioning wood shop. I chose paper out of necessity and pure happenstance. As strange as it may seem for a painter, the dialogue and vocabulary were the same. Picture frames are usually reserved for those most cherished memories, a family outing, <laughs> birthdays, <laughs> weddings, or holiday get-togethers. They rarely encapsulate the most influential yet traumatic events, a death in the family, trauma, or abuse. As Marianne Hirsch states, the viewer fills in what the picture leaves out. The horror of looking is not necessarily in the images, but in the story we provide to fill in what is left out of the image. My work seeks to investigate these moments as they force us to make decisions, decisions that lead to life-changing events. We either rise to the occasion or sink into despair. The work mimics and encapsulates these traumas within the fragility of paper. I began to collect discarded frames from antique stores and thrift shops at the beginning of 2016. They felt abandoned and forgotten, much like my memories and trauma. I was drawn to their opulence and ornateness, something so grand that it overshadows what it was intended to highlight. They became signifiers of status rather than memorialization of a frozen moment in time. By incorporating my paper sculptures into these frames, they are imbued with new life and become reliquaries for my mental anguish. Each opening resembles a scar, a wound, or even a disease. They challenge the viewer to face unfaceable and reflect on the past while reorient reorienting their own personal traumas. They're installed in salon-style groupings, reflecting on the Southern United States home and the collection of memories found in hallways or staircases. The overwhelming nature of each installation is purposeful, as trauma feels like the heaviest of burdens, something that time often doesn't heal. But there is a hopefulness within the saturation of color and delicateness of each cut. It is a way for individuals to celebrate one's life and have a memento of that cherished loved one. My work seeks to continue the tradition by putting a contemporary spin on the format and ideation of the memento. My process is labor intensive with each layer being cut by hand using only an exacto knife and hundreds of blades. Each piece starts with the selection of an ornate frame that has been scavenged from antique stores, thrift shops, and flea markets. These artifacts of someone's life used to hold a cherished memory, but now sits idle and lost to time, forgotten. My intent is to re-imbue them with a new life, healing the abandonment with delicate paper layers. Once the frame is chosen, I construct a matrix of illustration board, drywall, and wallpaper that the paper will be mounted to. The wallpaper is also sourced from various thrift shops, adding to the illusion of a forgotten time period. When this step is completed, I distress the surface as if it were a necrotic flesh wound, destroying the pristine nature of the surface, creating a wound reminiscent of my childhood trauma and the voids that were left from my parents' passing. Once the wound is established, I begin the healing process with my cut paper sculptures. This process is extremely intuitive, allowing each layer to inform the one below it with no real plan or schematic on how it will eventually turn out. I start by tracing in from the original opening about a sixteenth of an inch and use that as a starting point for the next layer. The first layer informs the second, the second the third, and so on until I hit the fifteen layer threshold for structural rigidity. The paper acts as a beautiful scar that heals the original opening, reminiscent of the mental and physical scars we collectively share.
Currently, my work has taken on a joyful shift in the realm of memento vivere, or to remember to live. The work addresses my trauma and mental abuse, while at the same time delves into the healing process and reinvigoration of life that I've been able to achieve over time through therapy, spousal support, and medication. I found new life in this body of work and a new happiness in the process of its creation. This piece is seven and a half feet by 15 feet wide. The new series is titled Memento Vivera Diddle. When I started college, I was a music and art major, uh, and I have kind of kept a lot of the percussion terminology within my work and then connect it to microbiological terminology as well. And it focuses on distressed drywall, drywall and hung cut paper. The drywall is aggressively destroyed with a hammer in hand, creating a visceral wound like opening and is cover, colorfully healed with my paper sculptures, creating beautiful scarifications. This was a beast to make because it would not fit in the house. So I actually had to, to build it on my driveway outside, destroy it out there, bring it in piece by piece. It's actually four drywall panels, either measuring three feet by four feet or four feet by eight feet. And then would lug those into the house and then work on them. It took about two and a half weeks from start to completion for this piece. So this leads me to my time in Lacoste. So in uh, early June, my work was selected to be part of an exhibition called Detour that was with the Moleskine Foundation, which is a sketchbook company that is creating a repository of sketchbooks from various artists. Uh, Hashimoto contemporary owner Ken Harmon contacted me, said he's starting a new gallery, wanted me to partake in this, and that if I did partake in it, there's a possibility that it would be shown at One World Trade Center. So I said, this sounds like a great opportunity got the sketchbook, excavated out everything from it. It was selected to be in uh, the One World Trade Center exhibition. So my wife and I went there for the exhibition. It was fantastic. Uh, but earlier in the day, before the show was set to open, I got this random Instagram message uh, from somebody at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Her name was Tiffany Taylor, and she said, hey, we love your work. We think it would be a really great opportunity for you to participate in this residency program in the south of France for two and a half months. And I said, awesome. Let's like make this happen. <laughs> and she told me the dates. And then I got concerned because I couldn't just say yes because it bled into my teaching obligations at Coastal. Uh, so I immediately made sure that it was a real message from a real person uh, and not a scam message. Uh, and I contacted my chair, Dr. Stephanie Miller, and I contacted uh, Claudia, Dr. Claudia Bornholt uh, and said, hey, this is, a, this is a thing that could happen. Is this doable, right? I don't want to let my students down. I don't want to you know, cause them any undue stress. But if we can make this work, it would be a really great opportunity. And they said, yes, why are you asking us? <laughs> like, go and do this. You've taught remotely for two years. You can do it for two weeks. I said, awesome. I got the permission. Uh, I submitted my dossier an hour before the exhibition opening. A week later, I got the approval from the board. And then a week after that, I got approval from the president of the university. Uh, it was an all-expense-paid all uh, residency program in the south of France at a town called Lacoste. It's where the Marquis de Sade Castle is. It's where Pierre Cardin lived for a little while. It's a Waldensian massacre <laughs> happened there as well between two different sects of Christianity. Magical, magical place. So, <laughs> so here's a view from Lacoste looking out onto the south of France, right? This was my home for two and a half, three months. We got to go to Cassis, which is on the edge of the Mediterranean. We got to put our feet into the Mediterranean Ocean. This is a view from one of the cafes within the town, uh, looking off into the distance at a town called Bonneu, uh, which is the next largest city over. Uh, I believe this is in St. Remy, uh, which is a beautiful town on a, a stretch of river that is just absolutely gorgeous. The water is frigid, um, but a beautiful, beautiful surroundings, right? That really kind of impacted the way that I thought about my work. 
uh, and this new kind of reinvigoration of this kind of memento vivere kind of phase of the work because I had to teach myself how to be happy again, right? Because my life was so traumatic that I didn't experience happiness for real. And now I have built a life that is all around happiness. So this is our backyard. This was at the cottage that we stayed in. There were five other atelier residents that we got to spend time with. Uh, each other, one was a, a furniture designer, one was a ceramicist, one was a contemporary quilter, uh, another one was a contemporary portrait painter, and the final uh, fellow was an animator that has worked for Leica, uh, which is a really kind of magical experience. So this is uh, the cave that I actually worked out of. Um, so the, the ateliers are pretty much caves that go up this kind of ancient city. Um, to play this. I got into TikTok over the summer for some reason. <laughs> so just another way to market the work. So at that residency, I proposed 30 pieces, and like Claudia said, I made 60 because I was so enthralled by the experience that I could not stop making until they said, stop making. <laughs> so I stopped. <laughs> so the last three weeks, I worked on other things with school and various different other projects that I was working on. Oh, no. There we go. So it really kind of transformed the way that I thought about my work. My work became more vibrant, it became more colorful, uh, it became more energetic. Uh, the colors were super saturated now and they were kind of getting into more of like glitter, holographic paper, super bright neons. They were just this reinvigoration of life. So some details of, I was able to take all the paper that I use with me to the south of France. I had three suitcases, each of them weighed 60 pounds a piece, and they contained all the paper that I was gonna use for the residency. I used probably two thirds of that paper in the creation of the work, and then left the rest <laughs> uh, for future classes and things for them to use. The work really became intimate at this point. They were all 11 inch by 11 inch squares. Right, so it became these kind of intimate moments that I was exploring, trying to kind of navigate this new world of happiness for myself. So there's some glitter and holographic paper. And then I started really kind of exploring light and how light kind of infused into the work. So these are backlit pieces um, that, they, that the light becomes transparent to some extent through the paper and it changes the light coloring as it comes through the front, right? There's a life force within each of these pieces. They feel that they are alive. Yeah. And then I also started working, uh, last semester I had a sabbatical, uh, which was magical but weird, right? I'm so used to like teaching and being engaged in the classroom and being like on point for my students and like letting them influence me as I influence them. Uh, and started thinking about tile in interesting ways. Um, so these are all sourced from Lowe's or Home Depot, and then distressed and destroyed, and then healed with the paper sculptures. You can see some of these in the gallery. I think there are one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six tile pieces within the gallery of varying different sizes. This piece was just in a show in Virginia that won an honorable mention, which was really nice. This piece is actually in the gallery, and it was the very first piece that I created within this tile series. So trauma is a shared experience we must all partake in. We can't run or hide from it, it is inevitable. How we deal with these traumas varies wildly. We navigate the abyss and do our best to survive the process. Often grief becomes overwhelming and perceivably insurmountable. But we all find our way through to the other side. Mortality is a constant proverbial light at the end of the tunnel, and we must face it in our own way. 
The grieving process, like my work, is unique and individualized to the person experiencing the pain. With time, the burden lessens and the pain diminishes, but never truly goes away. We cope the best we can and hold on to the memories of our loved ones for comfort and grace. Sometimes those memories can be brutal, but without them, we would not be who we are. The good, the bad, and the ugly define our persona and challenge us to be better than we were. I embrace both sides and imbue my work with the serenity that comes from the lived experience. Thank you so much for coming. So I, I don't know if people normally do this or not, but does anybody have any questions? Yes. Can you go back one slide, please? Yes. And I'm sorry, that was a very pedestrian question. No, you're fine. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how you make that fit in the space so you do it from the back. I, I, mean, I, I do. So the, what happens is I build a pristine thing, right? So I build a wooden cradle, I mount drywall to that, and then I mount ceramic tiles to that. And then once that dries, and it, cures, then I beat the heck out of it with a hammer and hand to hand manipulate the opening to an opening that I am satisfied with. Then from behind, I lay in a piece of paper, right? So this opening is a roughly 12 inches by 12 inches. So behind this, you only see a 12 inch by 12 inch block of paper. And then trace in that 16th of an inch, cut that out, let that layer inform the second, the second, the third, the third, the fourth, until it runs out of space, which is usually 15 to 20 layers deep. Yep. So it used to be roughly a quarter of an inch. Now it's much less than that uh, because wooden spacers and polystyrene spacers weren't working the way that I needed them to. So I started using illustration boards. So we're talking now maybe an 18th or an eighth of an inch, maybe. Yep. Anybody else? So you yes. 15 layers. So what's the significance of the 15 layers? So I have a finite space to work with between the drywall itself and the wall because the cradle itself that holds all this is roughly three inches deep. So that's about as much paper as I can fit within that three inch space to the wall. Now the other work is much bigger than that. So the very first piece that I introduced, those are 20 to 25 layers deep because they protruded from the wall so I had an infinite amount of space to go. But because it's encased in a box, I have a very finite amount of space that I can go. Anybody else? Yeah. When you were over in South Bank, mm -hmm. what was your wife thinking about you? Were you sending her pictures? <laughs> so yes, so we, had, we definitely had our daily kind of calls via Facebook Messenger. Um, she is currently writing a book with 50, 50 co-authors within that book uh, talking about death museums and heritage. Death, heritage, and museums? Museums, heritage, and death. <laughs> I knew it was one of them, one of them, uh, which is going to be a fantastic book uh, with contributors all over the world. So she, she was, including me, I'm in one of the chapters in that book, um, but uh, she was working on that project, and it, it was really a difficult decision for me, but I had been on sabbatical for like four months, and she was like, go. <laughs> get get, get out of here. <laughs> um, but luckily, we got it worked out. We both got accepted to a conference in York about, um, it's called DACnet Death and Culture Network, uh, and she presented a paper on uh, her class on death. I presented on my work uh, around more, Memento Mori, so she was able to come at the very tail end of the, of the, the experience. Yeah. What else? Anybody else got anything? Don't be shy. Maybe I answered everything. Maybe I'm that good. Yeah. Where did you purchase these pieces? Uh, men's Warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I saw, I was, it, it was one of those little Facebook ads that popped up one day and I was like, ooh. <laughs> and I immediately went there and I was like, oh, that's a good price. Done and done. <laughs> and it came within like a week later. <laughs> I'm a chromophile through and through, so I love color. So I'm not, whenever you see me around, I'm usually like the bright guy. <laughs> <laughs>
Anybody else? Yes. So there's a couple of different inspirations. So uh, I mentioned earlier that I was a double major when I entered college. So I was a music major and an art major. And both of those take an immense amount of time to perfect. And it just so happened I was better at art. Um, I was a percussionist. My wrists don't bend the way a percussionist rend, rend, like wrists should bend. So I could only get so good at that. But the, getting really good at art was like, you know, I could do that. Um, so I, I couldn't let music go, so in the very beginning they started out as action paintings. So I was dipping my drumsticks into house paint, playing on plastic, letting that kind of do its thing, let that dry, because plastic doesn't stick to plastic without heat, I would peel those forms up and they would act as stencils for my paintings. Um, when that kind of left the work, the forms stayed. Um, so I draw a lot of inspiration from that experience, but I also look at a lot of things under electron microscopes and just the kind of beauty of this kind of microscopic world that exists and how organic and kind of blobular a lot of those forms are. So I pull a lot of inspiration from that as well. Yes. So that's, that's a good, great question. So I, I use a company that actually puts UV protectant into their paper making so that it's light fast. Uh, and luckily they make about 200 different colors that I can pick and choose from. Uh, a lot of the times the colors are derived from the wallpaper that I use or the decorative paper that I use. Um, but a lot of times it's, it's a lot of trial and error, like stacking paper on top of each other, figuring out what that five color system is gonna be really thinking a lot about color theory and how colors interact with one another. Do I want it to optically blend? Do I want it to be this really kind of garish kind of like juxtaposition of colors? Um, so it's, you know, it's become very intuitive now because I've been doing this for about 15 years. Um, but that's one of the fun parts. I don't have to paint the paper. I can just like pick it out from my big shelf of paper that I just pull out from. Yeah. So that one piece. That this? This one, Ooh. yes. So Ooh. you can see the pattern of other pieces that we talked about. Mm -hmm. This is just more just like veins to me. Right. And it's, 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 I don't know, it's just really powerful. What, what brought you to that? So part of it was the cave experience, right? Being in Lacoste, being in this environment, having it be completely different than what I'm used to. And then also recalling like my experience with my mom and, and, and dad. Right, so thinking about veins, thinking about the amount of blood work that they had to have done, thinking about the ports that were put in, and then these kind of things flowing and dripping. Um, but it really, it really kind of got sparked by the cave environment that I was in for that long, uh, and really kind of exploring, because you can see that there's some stalactites and stalagmites, but then there are these kind of wispy lines that kind of go through everything, and it really kind of opens up the space a little bit more. Uh, and then once I set it on the table, and there was a light that was there, and it was just happenstance. Like, I didn't plan it, I didn't think about it. I just set it in front of this light, and I was like, whoa, holy crap. And then that started becoming part of the way that I explored and played with this kind of notion of light and the, the different forms that I was making. Do you think you're able to follow through maybe with more in this style compared to what yes, you're Yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll translate to newer work when I'm here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, it is. It is very therapeutic. If you're holding a sledgehammer or a hammer or like a little ball peen hammer for small stuff, it is a very cathartic experience. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. So oh, no, Jim. Nope. Sorry. I saw one hand. <laughs> oh, got in there. Okay. No, you're fine. So what I tell my students all the time is there's nothing that you experience, there's nothing that you hold, there's nothing you touch, there's nothing in life that doesn't have an artist's hand attached to it. The seats that you're sitting in were designed by somebody. The clothes you're wearing are designed by a designer and then modified by an artist. The cars you drive, the building we're in, is all designed by an art student at some point in life. 
Um, so don't let anybody tell you you can't do this because it is super plausible that you can and that you know many more artists than you let on. It's also about really hard work. You gotta be in it to win it. Not win it, but to be in it for the long haul, right? This is not a flash in the pan career. This is an extended period of time in which you're gonna be working in, right? The harder you work, the more luck you have, right? The best advice I ever got from a professor was have enough, ex enough work to have two solo exhibitions at any point in time. That way, if somebody comes a calling, you don't have to say no, right? I never have to say no because I have 700 frames sitting in my house <laughs> or I have 50 drywalls sitting in my house, right? It's not luck, it's opportunity, yeah? Um, so don't believe the dissenters, right? And it is hard, don't get me wrong. It's hard just like anything else is hard. You get a business degree, there's no guarantee you're gonna be a business person, right? You get a theater degree, there's no guarantee that you're gonna be a theater person. It's how much work you put into it that you'll get out of it. That's snippet, I guess. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, all right, that's it. <laughs> <laughs>